So at 14 years old, I, I can recall opening the first page of that book. And um, Thomas Merton said, he said, as for me, I have but one desire, the desire for solitude, to be lost in the secret of God's face, he said. So when I read that at 14, I did not know what that meant. But something in me did, because I said, me too. Mm. Me too. And it named me. It just named me. And there was such um, vulnerable purity to his words. I could tell when he, and he was like this in person too when he spoke. There wasn't hearsay. You could tell he was speaking out of a depth, you know, of how he was transformed so mysteriously by God. And he, he's sharing it with us. He's sharing it with us. And uh, that awakening in me, uh, Zen Master Dogen says, uh, find that person uh, whose teachings arouse within you a desire for the great way and forget everything else as your teacher. Thomas Merton once said, there are certain spiritual writers that ring your bell. You read it and something in your heart. You know, you know they're talking about what your own stir, you know, they put words to it like this. And so for the four years of high school, the violence continued. It got worse, actually. I just read the sign of Jonas over and over and over again. And that's what led me to go to the monastery. And uh, so it's, it's so strange how we can be blindsided by grace like that. And uh, our whole life can change in the twinkling of an eye. Really. Good people, welcome to a special episode of Contemplify. This is coming out of the normal seasonal format because today my friend and teacher, James Finley, is on Contemplify. I was overly giddy and strangely nervous, but above all, I'm grateful to be in conversation with Jim about his breathtaking new book, The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. Each page is a thousand pages deep. That is how Jim walks about the world. He draws from the depth and teaches it with winsome grace, poetics, and of course, wisdom. I have read The Healing Path twice now. I don't see an end to rereading it. It charts the unfolding of Jim's life. The terrorizing trauma and abuse he endured as a child and also at the monastery. The graced invitations of transformation amidst that anguish. Direct spiritual guidance from Thomas Merton. The richness of a marriage to his beloved late wife, Maureen. And so much more. The Healing Path is published by the fine folks over at Orvis Books, who are bringing us some of the best contemplative writing this side of the century. The Healing Path comes out today. I have bought copies for friends and family. It is a rare and delicate thing to say about a book, but I'm going to say it anyway. The Healing Path could change your life. Pick up your copy today. Hell, get it from the library. I just want you to read this book. Hey everyone, it's Paul, and this is Contemplify, where we seek to kindle the examined life for contemplatives in the world. A quick story before we jump into the conversation. I first met Jim 15 years ago when I was but a lowly intern at a contemplative organization. We were hosting a big conference, and as it often happens at such events, there was a big banquet. I happened to be sitting next to Jim at a dinner table alongside Richard Rohr and Cynthia Bourgeau. Luck and grace seemed to be conspiring for my benefit that evening. Richard and Cynthia fell into a quick conversation. Jim and I shrugged, looked at each other, and guessed that we were one another's evening entertainment. I, of course, was thrilled because I was obsessed with Thomas Merton and knew that Jim actually knew and sat at the feet of my hero. I started off by peppering Jim with questions about Merton. Jim's eyes sparkled in animated response. But then, slowly, my questions shifted from Merton to just a shared conversation about life and Jim's work. 
I learned what and how Jim read, his practices, his work as a therapist and teacher, his life as a father and husband. And he asked about my journey, my internship, the hopes and dreams of this 20-something. And we laughed our asses off. I was spellbound by how his presence radiated with the qualities of divine love. I'm tearing on now, but the point I am sharpening is that Jim Finley is a rare teacher whose guileless poetic teachings have an eternal and evergreen quality to them. Now here's the official bio. Student of Thomas Merton and clinical psychologist, Dr. James Finley teaches how connecting to our divine indwelling can transcend fear and shame and awaken to our true self. A faculty member at the Center for Action and Contemplation, he is the author of Merton's Palace of Nowhere, The Contemplative Heart, and coming out today, folks, is his latest book, The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. Jim is the host of the best contemplative podcast out there today, Turning to the Mystics. His conversation partner in podcasting is the terrific Kirsten Oates. And in our conversation today, we talk about Jim's book, The Healing Path, a memoir and an invitation. And our conversation floats around key reflections from his book on the trauma he endured and the grace invitations. Stories about Thomas Merton's attention and wit, bringing the monastic sensibilities and rhythms into his daily life in the world, and so much more. And here I am again, losing my voice, joyfully talking about Jim. Let's get to this conversation. I want to say one more time, I recommend The Healing Path wholeheartedly. Buy it, get it from the library, borrow a copy. I was about to say steal a copy, but I'll just take that back. You will reread it and you will gift it to those who understand that The Healing Path is always mysteriously unfolding. Or how Jim might say it in his beautiful, poetic way of speaking. God protects us from nothing, but inexplicably sustains us in everything. Words to meditate on. Words out of the heart of this book. And as always, you can visit Contemplify.com for the show notes on this conversation and sign up for the monthly Contemplify non-required reading list. Without further ado... Join me in raising a glass to my guest and friend today, James Finley. begin by saying that you know I've, I've read your book twice now and the thing that's really become evident to me is that each page is a thousand pages d- deep and that we could talk for hours on the little pieces on each page and so my intention here in our conversation today is not to cover the whole book because that would be impossible because of the depth that it carries and I also recognize that if we were to have this conversation again tomorrow, we would talk about a whole slew of different things. So I, I just want to just open that door of permission that like it's soaked in the depth of your of your own life and that uh, it's impossible to cover someone's entire life in one book and let alone in one conversation. So uh, I look forward to just traversing where we traverse. You know, in your book, you talk about your grandmother uh, sipping tea and telling dirty jokes and smoking those hand rolled smokes. Yeah. I wanted to begin by asking, yeah. do you remember any of the jokes that she told you? Uh, no, I remember a lot of my mother told a lot of jokes. A lot of them were dirty jokes. And uh, she told jokes, but it was more like joking about life ah. for my grandmother. It's like seeing the humor and the, the things that her children, my aunts and uncles were doing. And life and my 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 mother and you know it was more like that than telling jo- jokes itself you have such a wonderful sense of humor do you feel like that came from your grandmother and your mother 
down to you? Is that where that that sharp? Uh, I think it came from? more from my mother. Yeah, I think my mother's my grandmother's jokes was seeing the humor in things, but my mother had more of a wit. Okay, you know, a kind of that whatever that humor is that allows a person to see the funny side of something and then put that funniness in words to make you laugh when they say it. You know, she had that kind of thing to her. Yeah. And that, that, that timing. Uh, I want to tell you too, that reminds me at the monastery, Merton and I were talking in spiritual direction and, and uh, he said, you know, this whole spiritual path, this life, he said, it's as serious as death and without a sense of humor, you won't make it. Mm. So there has to be laughter kind of uh, finds a kind of joy or, or finds a kind of freedom, you know, in, in the midst of the saga, you know, the journey. Yeah. yeah that, that comes through uh, in some of your teachings and uh, obviously Merton as well. Also, yeah. I, I feel like he could lean into the absurd side of humor too quickly. Uh, that would yeah. be that surprise, that shock. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Um, and he was so astute about it. Like, um, you saw the humor, when I was in the monastery, there was this old lay brother there, Brother Dominic. And uh, he must have been near, like nearly 100 years old. I was 18 when I entered. And um, he walked around with two canes. He was all kind of bent over. On the, on the Feast of St. Dominic every year, mm -hmm. he, um, uh, the, he wrote a letter to note to the abbot and had the abbot announce that today was St. Dominic's feast day. It's the feast day of Brother Dominic. So Brother Dominic would stand with his two canes and bow to the community like this. And so Merton was sure he'd kind of imitate Dominic bowing <laughs> like this. And he said, Brother Dominic is a holy old man. He said, but the problem is that he makes something out of the fact he's been here so long. Mm -hmm. And the moment you make anything out of anything, you're dead. See? And so he was so good at imitating and seeing humor in it. And then you could always see a point in it. And uh, uh, there was always you know, that insight mingled with the humor. Yes. It's always part of how he taught, I think. That's a keen observer of life. To, to and by, by the, by, I, by the, I would add too, I would add too that by anything out of anything, I think he meant we take anything that's a gift or an ability or an attainment or anything that's a weakness or a flaw and we attribute to it the authority to name who we are. Mm. See? That, that any contingency, any conditioned state uh, taken as, an, as uh, the authority to name who we are, we're dead. Because we, we, it, it blinds our ability to see the boundaryless mystery uh, manifesting itself as our life, you know, as our breath, as our heartbeat. And uh, we, 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 yeah, I think that's a yeah. key insight. Yeah, it's the brilliance of Merton. I feel like never fails to, to, to startle me awake in different ways. Uh, your book, The Healing Path, a memoir and invitation. It's not the typical memoir. And I wanted to talk for a second about the structure of it because you don't cover every year of your life where, the way a typical memoir does. And it, it made me thinking about how memoirs are often a closed system that no matter how fascinating the person is, you get this book and it's like the confines, the container of their life. Right. But there's this, uh, in your memoir, it's, it's so true to who you are in the structure itself. It felt like a, a, a poetic structure that me as a reader that I was invited into and that like a poem, the invitation to the text also carries its way out into my body as a reader and that the restraints of the structure, they actually offer more possibility for me as a reader because I'm not stuck in that closed system of a memoir. What was it about the structure of a memoir and an invitation that resonated with you to write with this in mind? Yes, you know, uh, the, the, the opening lines of the f introduction that... Um, where I said, in writing these reflections, I'm inviting you to join me um, in exploring the path, the way of life, in which we're healed from all that hinders us, mm. from experiencing the steady, strong currents of divinity that flow on and on in the bittersweet alchemy of our lives. 
So the very first sentence of the book uh, is in the poetic voice. Yeah. So the sentence doesn't really uh, explain anything. You know, it doesn't define anything, but it bears witness to the to the intimacy of a kind of an overflowing fullness. It's there, and then the the dilemma of the suffering of uh, being exiled from that fullness, and so the, that first line sets the tone for the whole book. So I tried to stay there in that kind of poetic, uh, you know, evocative uh, uh, witness to this d d death dimension that's in all of us. Merton says it beats in our very blood whether we want it to or not. Mm. And uh, so to me that was key to the book. So the me there was a, a saying, you know, the medium is the message. Yeah. So the mode in which it's written itself uh, bears witness and embodies and invites uh, sensitivity to these uh, interior dimensions of ourself. You know? And how we can uh, be healed from all that exiles us from, from those interior dimensions, mm -hmm. and how to live in greater fidelity to those dimensions. Yeah. And as you write with that poetic voice, you, you name that you know the uh, sincere intention of your memoir is to help others, and that your writing of this right. memoir came at a time when you had just were losing Maureen, and that you wondered if by this sincere intention to help others, that it also might offer an opening for the healing presence in your life again, by that by that writing and by that right. intention. And I'm wondering for you, Jim, as you were working on that book, did that sincere intention create that opening for you? Yes, well, uh, what I say is that, say where the book begins where I'm sitting next to Maureen, who was in the final stages of dying from Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And she died in in-house hospice, so the bed was out in the living room right here. And uh, her ashes are there now out on the table. I sit next to her ashes every morning when I'm writing. And uh, so I was uh, sitting there uh, just as her death was approaching. That's where I start. And so I, I realize that the, uh, the the, 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 the sorrow of the moment, because it was so immensely sorrowful, um, was, was intermingled with a kind of um, uh, a sensitivity to the spiritual dimensions of it all. It didn't take the death away, it didn't take the loss away, yeah. but it, it showed that the sorrow of it didn't have the final say in what was happening to this. And so I... I I share with the reader, with the readers, what I shared with her talking. I share it in the book about an insight into death that Thomas Merton shared at the monastery. So what I do then, as I say that in the memoir, I want to go back to the very beginning of my life, starting at age three. And um, I share these experiences of severe trauma, hands of a violent alcoholic father. And through my mother, who was a devout Roman Catholic, kind of instilled in me this sense of God-sustaining presence. It was like a lifeline for me. And I can remember lying in the dark at each three, listening to my father beat my mother outside the door and praying to God the way frightened children pray in the dark. And experiencing that God heard my prayer, came to me in the dark and merged with me. And so this strange thing through my whole life were trauma and transcendence intermingle with each other, you know, like the, this strange interplay. And uh, so when Maureen was dying, in the sadness of it all, I realized I'd been here before. Mm. But my whole life can be a pattern where birth and death and gain and loss and sorrow and joy, the alchemy uh, of life. And I can learn to be in the stream of that alchemy and go with the flow of it and not, not get, not drown in the intensity of the immediacy of a situation. And I do drown because I'm just human, but I regain my balance as much as possible. And every time I slip and fall and I get up and move on, I hope, hopefully move a little wiser about what all this is about and what's happening. And then when I became a psychotherapist for almost 30 years, I just sat with a lot of men and women who shared their story of this with me. I, I try to help them get at this level that we're talking about right now. And uh, so that's kind of the big part of the tone of the whole book, yeah. really, I think. 
Yeah, I have, I have that image of tides that come in and out and trying to just habituate yourself to the sense that these tides come in and out and that you don't want to get barreled over by one tide and also uh, when the tide goes back out to, to just be at a loss that will never come back in. Exactly. And so part of what you're saying is to, to just to know that these rhythms and these tides are part of the, the, the totality of this life, this journey. Exactly. <clears throat> when I would go in to see Thomas Merton for spiritual direction, one on one on one direction with mm -hmm. him, <clears throat> he would, he would usually ask three questions. Always, we would go through these three questions together. And the first one was always like, "How's it going?" You know, like, "How you doing?" Like, "What's it like being you here?" And uh, sometimes I would say to him, uh, "You know, I, I'm doing great." I'm in a good place. He said, well, don't make too much of it. It'll get worse. <laughs> and if I would go and say, I'm really having a hard, hard time. Well, don't make too much of it. It'll get better. And when it was going, when it was going badly, he would, he would s listen to me. He would join me and help me. But what he really tried to help me see is the rhythm uh, of it. And what's the interplay of that rhythm in, in my life? And what can I learn by living in fidelity to it? You know, to the grace that shimmers and shines with the ribbon itself. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. One of the things that you've mentioned a couple of times in the book is uh, contemplative living as an art. And you talk about being guided by Merton in that and having be passed down from Merton, this art of contemplative living. I hear you pointing to that and what you just shared now. How, do, do you think of the contemplative life as an art form? <clears throat> Well, I would say it would be one way to express it, mm -hmm. I guess. Let's say we go along day by day to our, you have your life, I have mine. We're living our life. And, um, and the complexities of it, all the challenges of it, all the, all that. And then from time to time, we're, we're graced with an inner quickening. And Merton uses examples of this out in the midst of nature. He says, we turn to see a flock of birds descending. And, uh, uh, as if out of the corner of our eye, we catch something in their descent, this primordial, vast, and true. And these moments might come to us in the arms of the beloved, might come to us reading a child a good night story. It might come to us in a quiet hour at day's end. It might come in a pause between lines of a poem. It, it comes as it comes. It, but it's, it's kind of being uh, graced with a quickening of awareness, of a kind of strange fullness this carrying us along, and uh, it comes like a glimpse, like that. And then when the moment passes, we return back to the day by day. We're already late for the next meeting, or we, our ruminations, we go on and on. So then but what, what we can start to see is it can start to grow in us a desire to learn to find our way to a more abiding awareness of the depth so fleetingly glimpsed. That is, there, there is an awareness that in these little flashpoints of fullness, it's not as if something more is given to us, but a curtain opens and we fleetingly glimpse the abyss-like nature of every moment. And so how can I, what is the path or the way of life in which I can become habituated in that abyss-like depth, you know, and learn to live in fidelity to it and to be led by it and nurtured by it, and then to share that inner awakening stands with others day by day. And I think in that sense, it's an art. See? It's, an, it's an art form of, of habituating mm -hmm. this sense. Of, I, I call it uh, incarnate infinity intimately realized. There's like an infinite boundarylessness that's incarnating itself as every breath and heartbeat. And I intimately realize that. And having realized it, I long to habituate and live in that abiding awareness that I know is always there. Yeah. I so appreciate that because it, it it leans into uh, not trying to necessarily learn how to add things on into your life, but if there's a, a, a sense of releasing all that gets in the way of that that alchemy or all that that gets in the way of uh being in that stream so it's more of um 
finding, finding your habituating towards those glimpses because, uh, the glimpse may have caught your eye, but you also know that, uh, there's other things vying for your attention that don't, that even need your attention, but how you approach that, uh, with a certain type of gentleness is what allows for that to, to expand or to connect at a, such a place that can become more habitual. Yes, here's the way it helps me to say yeah. it, to, 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 to see it. Is, um, you know, when we go through life, uh, most things that we notice, uh, we kind of notice on in passing on our way to something else. You know, in the momentum of the day's demands, we, we're just kind of carried along by things. And then uh, we, we get a feeling that there's something missing. There's something missing. And you get the, we get the feeling that we're skimming over the surface of the depths of our own life. That's the intuition. And what's regrettable about it is the depth over which we're skimming is that God's unexplainable oneness with us is hidden in those very depths. And we're given to realize it in these flashpoints of awareness. Like we get a taste that I, I can't explain it, but I know it's true because I, I experienced it mm -hmm. like this. And, uh, and so I will not play the cynic. I won't break faith with my awakened heart. Uh, I want to find my, because I experience these moments of awakening as homecoming. It's like a homecoming in the depths of things, this ribbon through the ordinariness of what's happening. And so I think that, 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 that sensitivity and that, that longing to, 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 but that's the path. Mm -hmm. Then how do I go about doing that? Like, what's that look like? Or, and then I realized, that even seeking uh, uh, is itself part of the problem because to see, like there's something missing. So we think what's missing is more of this, the more more things. Thomas Merton once said, our minds are like crows. They pick up everything that glitters, no matter how uncomfortable or nesky with all that metal in them. So it's already crowded. So we think if I get one more thing, like one more thing. Yeah. But uh, what's missing isn't found among the things we can attain or among the things we can lose. Mm -hmm. What's missing is our capacity to abide in the depth that alone is ultimately real and is welling up, or it beats in our very blood whether we want it to or not. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of sensitivity, that or the, the gift of starting to be sensitized to that moves us. How do I move in the direction of... Uh, uh, actualizing that desire to abide. Yes. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. This brings to mind one of your early experiences, you know, you were talking about the way that you would hear the abuse that your mother was taking from your father and the way that God saved you in this way of becoming interiorly grounded in that sustaining presence of God and that, that you would be hidden in God in that way. And you talk about Our Lady of Fatima being playing an important role in that early grounding. Can, can you speak about what kind of door that opened for you at that age? Yes. Yeah, let me, uh, I'm gonna back up. I wanna add a yeah. piece of this I think is important. Sure. Um, you know, when I had that experience there in the dark of God merging with me, uh, that in that in the morning when I got up the next day the violence still continued. Yeah, but it was it was much better for me because when I would when my father thought he was yelling at me or hitting me, he didn't know he was hitting that other little boy that people can see. He didn't know the real me was hidden had its refuge in God that my father didn't know anything about. So later when I became a, a clinical psychologist. I came to realize I borrowed my mother's religious imagery to give meaning to dissociating. I dissociated off like this. And a God, it doesn't mean that God wasn't present in it, but it does mean that the fullness of what was given to me was impaired because mm -hmm. it was in the service of maintaining a survival strategy. It would take a long time to find my way out of that. And um, so I want to add that little piece yeah. of Both that could for, be true for a lot of us. How, both, both can be, and they often are true at once. Yeah. They often are. Yeah, God's not waiting 
for us to get past our mishaps and confusion. But God illumines and awakens us in the midst of our confusion and sustains us there in ways that are uh, uh, impaired by the confusion itself, but God is still there. But as we go, as we learn to mature with God's grace, we become more and more uh, reality-based, more mature, more helpful and effective ways that are more freed up from those in, impairments. And at the same time, the impairment that we were in was the context in which we were found. Mm. You know, so just, just like just like respecting, you know, limitations and growing out of it and so on. So it was in the midst of that. That when I was, um, my mother was a Val Catholic, and her sister, my Aunt Lucille, was a nun. And I was in the seventh grade, and she gave me the book Our Lady of Fatima by, by Walsh. And it's a story of these visions of Mary that these children had in Portugal, a series of them, really. And um, so, so when I read that book, it just made it so vividly more real what I was experiencing. So I share in the book when I was about the same time, too, as when I was in the second grade, I received my first Holy Communion in the Catholic Church, received the Eucharist for the first time. And I, I really believe that Church teaches that the death is the presence of Jesus is present in the Eucharist. And I can remember going up with my mother at Mass to receive the host and coming back, and I put the kneeler down. I would kneel down, I'd put my face in my hands, and I would hold real, real still. And in my mind, at seven years old, since I was in the church, I was kneeling inside of God. And because I just received the Eucharist, I was kneeling inside of God who was inside of me. And I'd hold real, real still. And it was like the gate of heaven. Mm. So even though it was a child's perception, I think the grace of it, do I mean, often, I think this is often true when we look at our spiritual path. Yeah. We look back, and the, oh, I love interviews too with poets and artists and people. Very often, the first little glimmers often came to them when they were very little, like the intimations of something. And uh, we learn to outgrow it and into more mature, but we're careful not to close off that initial magic. Jesus said, be wise as a serpent and simple as a dove. To be wise as a serpent is to be street smart not to be naive about the ways of this world, but don't get so street smart that you close off that childlike uh, shine, mm -hmm. you know, that quietness in your heart, that you don't lose contact with that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you talk um, in your teachings in your book about childlike transparency in a way, as that shining of, of the quality of God. Um, I'm curious for you, Jim, would, would you recognize like whether it was in your your practice uh with therapy when you saw that childlike transparency come out in somebody that you were working with did that become a cue for you to lean in and try to draw them out more because of what that what was was that an indication of an opening that was happening in in the present moment and maybe i'll just to go back for, to um like i think about the ways in which when um, I'm excited before I know why I'm excited, but I'm just excited about something or I'm vulnerable before I recognize I'm exactly, vulnerable. Exactly, yes. Exactly. That, uh, yeah. that life itself, the spirit is, is overwhelming me to, to break forth from who I'm trying to project to the world that I am, but just who I am and who God is in me is, is showing all the cards at that moment. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on the importance of childlike transparency. Uh, well, this is my sense of it. And I'm saying this now as a therapist, mm -hmm. working with like trauma survivors and so on. And I'll share an example that I use in the book. I share some examples from therapy uh, that would model this in a way. And then I'll share my approach to it. I was once seeing a woman in therapy and her issue is that when she was a little girl, it, it, her father and mother never physically or sexually abused her. But they would very violently argue with each other in ways that would just scare her to death. But they were so intensely engaged in their rage toward each other, they couldn't see her. They couldn't see what they were doing to her. And she shared with me that one summer night, they were having one of their arguments. 
and she opened the back screen door uh, the, uh, let out into the backyard at night. And there was a tree growing in her backyard. <clears throat> and she crawled up in the low branches of that tree. And she could hear her parents arguing inside the house. And she said she closed one eye and lined up a twig with a star. And she said to God, if you know I'm here, make that star move to the other side of the twig. And um, uh, she said, you know, she said God didn't move the star. And then she said, but there's something about the remembrance of myself sitting alone in the dark as a little girl in the low branches of a tree waiting for God to move a star that consoles me, she said. And, and I said to her, you know, um, it's true God didn't move the star. But what's so fascinating, in years later in sharing that story with me, your heart was moved. Mm. And because you shared it with me, I was moved. And therefore, I have a thought that in our work together, whenever we get to places where we feel stuck, we'll imagine that we're sitting alone together in the low branches of that tree waiting for God to move a star. So here's my approach. When a person is first emerging into kind of a clarity, but they don't know yet exactly to understand the clarity that's emerging, uh, to lean in closer, you could, it's like you need to be very careful not to uh, get ahead of the person that we're with in therapy. by Because you might see immediately the intuition of what's happening. But if you say it to them like a little lecture, oh, listen to this, by getting ahead of them that way, you're actually falling behind them. Mm. Because you're always there to join them as a kind of an invitational sense that they're not alone. You know, I wonder what this is. I wonder what this is. And uh, that, that's always been my approach. Always, it's kind of a, it's a, like bound, like being very sensitive about boundary violations, mm -hmm. and letting a person find their own way into the clarity of what's emerging in themselves, like this. And so, it's, there's always an invita a non-impositional, invitational stance. That's my feel, yeah. my sense of it. So that they can make the discovery for themselves and not have you point out, you know, exactly. You're a narcissist or you're yeah. a very loving parent, but to allow that discovery yeah, to happen or to what, be exactly. an event. Yes. And I also feel sometimes often we can have the feeling we're in the presence of someone who's more present to us than we are. Yeah. And sometimes they can see in us a value we can't yet see. And we somehow learn to have faith in their faith in us. Yeah. And it arcs over, but we also notice that they're 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 non non impositional. They don't intrude upon us, but rather sit with us as we evolve into clarity. And and I think that's the uh, compassionate art form. Uh, so that's why psychotherapy, the depth dimension, is like meditation for two. It's two people sitting together, and I think intimate conversations between lovers or between uh, spouses or between parents with their children mm -hmm. or suffering, it always has that mysterious interplay, you know, about it, yeah. I think. Yeah, it's so true that, and when, and when that intimacy catches me, do I, do I have the fortitude to just, to be present to that gazing and not try to fill it with, with something, but uh, allow what comes up to come up uh, and attend to that instead yeah, exactly. of, um, you know, exactly. how's the weather? Yeah, and then there's something else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Then there's something else about it. Let's say it comes up and you say, how's the weather? Yeah. And so uh, I, I, uh, I know that what just happened uh, was you were kind of unexplainably overwhelmed by more openness than you were ready for. You know, you weren't ready for it. And so when you said, you look out the window and talk about the weather, you were actually pacing yourself like this. And so I, I may just let it go. I just, enough for now. But again, I may later, if I, as, a, as a question, I might say, you know, I was just struck by the fact that you had said this. And then you turned and you, you pointed out about the weather. And I'm just curious. You know, I wonder what that... So when you start to share with somebody 
the ways that you back away from getting close to what you're looking for yeah. and start to share it. There's, there's that, that's the delicacy, like non-impositional delicacy yes. of the path that people, the healing path. Yes. You know. That delicacy is such a great word for that. It is. And I, I'm reminded right now of a quote from your book where you hear about monasteries for the first time in high school, and then you hear about this new famous monk named Thomas Merton, and you go to the library, and you pick out the sign of Jonas, and that mm -hmm. you see something in him uh, that's recognize his own poverty and limitations in the presence of God. And that helps to recognize that in yourself as well. Could you, like when I think about you in that moment, in that high school, discovering that book, you know, there it, it is a, a gateless gate to the rest of your life in so many ways. And we all have many of those times. Yeah. When you look back on that now, after these years, what does that moment how does that moment shine for you? Well, for first to me, uh, first of all, in general, first, I think, uh, let's say the people listening to us, they're listening to this conversation. Mm -hmm. And each one listening to this would ask themselves this question. Like, how has it come to pass that I've become the person who's even capable of being concerned about and aware of such things. At the level I'm presently concerned and aware of it. And is it not true that maybe not all that long ago it wasn't like this? And you go back far enough, you might, have, you might have been clueless about it, really. But what you realize as you look back, like the winding path, there were quickenings, yeah. like little flashpoints. And uh, T.S. Eliot says in Four Quartets, we had the experience of miss the meaning. Yeah. So sometimes we're in water over our head, we were touched by something. And it isn't until years later we can look back and appreciate like the, the slow emergence of something, you know? And uh, so it's like that. So for me what it was is uh, the, this clo cloistered monastery in the Catholic tradition. So getting up at 2.30 in the morning and uh, chanting the Psalms, we lived in silence, and a life of uh, seeking God, and giving ourselves to God, and believing in our heart that that inner fidelity, to solitary prayer seeking God, touches the whole world in ways we don't understand. That we're all woven, interwoven into each other, and uh, so he wrote his journal as a monk called the Sign of Jonas, like swallowed by the whale and the Sign of Jonas. And in the opening, so at 14 years old, I, I can recall opening the first page of that book. And um, Thomas Merton said, he said, as for me, I have but one desire, the desire for solitude, to be lost in the secret of God's face, he said. So when I read that at 14, I did not know what that meant. But something in me did, because I said, me too. Mm. Me too. And it named me. It just named me. And there was such um, vulnerable purity to his words. I could tell when he, and he was like this in person too when he spoke, there wasn't hearsay. You could tell he was speaking out of a depth, you know, of how he was transformed so mysteriously by God. And he, he's sharing it with us. He's sharing it with us. And uh, that awakening in me, uh, Zen Master Dogen says, uh, find that person uh, whose teachings arouse within you a desire for the great way and forget everything else is your teacher. Thomas Merton once said, there are certain spiritual writers that ring your bell. You read it, and something in your heart. You know, you know they're talking about what your own stir, you know, they put words to it yeah. like this. And so for the four years of high school, the violence continued. It got worse, actually. I just read the sign of Jonas over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And that's what led me to go to the monastery. And uh, so it's, it's so strange how we can be blindsided by grace like that. Yeah. And uh, our whole life can change in the twinkling of an eye. Yeah. Really. I, I think it's so important that you point out, too, that it that discovery didn't end the trauma that you were experiencing at home. That was still very much oh. a part of life and even intensified 
even as this discovery was yeah in some ways that guiding light to wh where you were going to head to you know when i uh, graduated from high school my father didn't come to my graduation he was, was drunk and, mm -hmm. and i say this to my father he was a tragic figure yeah you know i won't go into all that now but i've I went through all that and forgiven him. He's passed away now. But to just show you the world that I lived in, uh, the day after I graduated, he didn't know I wanted to be a monk. He and my mother would fight a lot about religion and and so on. So he was trimming the hedges out front of the house, and uh, my voice was shaking. I was. I said, "I want to. I want to leave and go to the monastery and be a monk." And he said, "Well," he said, he had never heard of such a thing. I said, I want to go live in silence and prayer and seek God for myself and for the world. And he said to me, if you go to that place, he said, I'll kill your mother to go there. And he said, that's not a threat. I'll kill her if you go there. And I walked away. I left the next morning, left a note on my bed. I was used to it. So that's the world I lived in. Wow. That's the world I lived in. And, um, and so it's so strange for me how uh, the intensity of brokenness and the intensity of interior liberations, like alchemy, mm. have been so intermingled in my life. And all the people that I would sit with in therapy, as they share their story, the details are never the same, but the essence is always the same. Mm. Oh, there's all this mysterious touch point between loss or pain or sadness, whatever, and a quiet light that shines through the sadness. Quiet. But sometimes it's buried under the avalanche of internalized pain, and you, th you have to unpack the rubble. In the process of unpacking it, the light starts shining through. Mm. And it's a very mysterious process, yeah. really, I think. That image is so vivid of the rubble and the light. Um, yeah. when, it, when you left for the monastery, did it, did it feel like you were leaving all, of, like... In your mind, were you saying goodbye to your family forever? Because I think at that point in time, that was basically what happened when you joined a monastery. Is that correct? Where you there was no no sense because no sense of seeing family again potentially, uh, and you didn't know the well being of your mother when you left. That you would have entered with that sense of uh, one life ending, another life beginning. I would say this. Uh it's so unusual. Most religious communities, like Richard Rohr's and the Franciscans and so on, their active orders are not like it. But in, at least back then, too, and now, too, because it was a cloistered uh, order, it was cloistered. You, you weren't allowed to visit home. I never left. But you, your family was allowed to visit you once a year for three days. Okay. You could write back and forth. Letters were limited, but you could write. So I was very, like, so, but when I left her, uh, and I, when I left the house, I, I, I didn't feel I was leaving my home because I had none. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? It was just, it just, it didn't feel like a, I, I was, there was no home in my house. And, uh, so when I went to the monastery, then this place of silence was like my family. Yeah. Like with God, with this kind of God filled community of people. And, um, uh, so then when the uh, when I was traumatized in the monastery through the sexual abuse, I had a breakdown and I had to leave. Uh, I think that's when I felt I'd lost my family. Because mm -hmm. I thought my situation was worse. Because in the, when I was at home, there was a place I could go to to be with God, the monastery. But having been traumatized in the monastery, there was no place to go. There was no place to go. And so I came back home and there was a deeper level of homelessness okay. for me, you know, from which then, as I tell my story, I went even deeper in homecoming out of that homelessness, like the pattern. It was the current pattern of the same, the pattern that runs through the whole book. Yes. Really. So it was kind of like that for me, I guess. And you, you named that by the experience of that abuse in the monastery is that there is no place you can go where trauma will not find you or this terrorizing will not find you and, 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 yeah yeah i say in the book you know go go ahead no no you go ahead go ahead i was gonna say do, uh, i want to say uh, uh what dawned on me was it was a painful realization that the, there's no place on this earth so innocent or so pure where the brutal and the destructive and the unfair 
might not find you and bring you down. Because just because you're at home, it doesn't mean you're safe at home. And just because you're in a monastery doesn't mean you're safe in a monastery. And I would say that realization would be a recipe for despair if it wasn't for the realization um, that the brutality of this world has no refuge from an oceanic mercy that transcends and permeates the sorrow of this world unexplainably forever. It doesn't take it away, but it unexplainably permeates. And in Christian, every world religion has a different language for this. A self, experiential salvation. But in the Christian tradition, it's the mystery of the cross. It's this mystery of this deathless love that transcends, permeates cruelty and death completely. And I, how do I learn to find my way to that and live by it? Mm-hmm. You know, your, your experience of the monastery as you write about it, uh, the way that that mercy permeates uh, in your experience there, as also the trauma and terrorizing is happening, just right. highlights that for for those of us as we reflect on our own lives and the way that that's also occurred, where there's been the terror and there's also been the permeation of mercy. Um, I want to ask a bit about that, uh, those experiences of mercy. Like, like you went in as a lay brother with um, the, in, the intention of, no intention of becoming a choir monk, which uh, chanting the Psalms in Latin and 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 heading towards priesthood. Um, but I, I, what was it like for you to begin to be steeped in that monastic silence, in that chanting of the Psalms for six years? Like you, you talk about how there's some words that 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 resonate with the with the silence that is soaked in the monastery. Um, what is it like to enter a place of that from the, that permeation side of things uh, where you begin to habituate yourself in, in these practices and rhythms of life? After yearning for all those years to be a part of it, what, what was that like for you uh, to receive some of the, those mercies? Well, I explained in the book, too, that when I entered, uh, and again, I was associative and traumatized and didn't know it, so I had a very immature thing. But, um, you know, they shaved off all my hair, kind of a symbol for enunciation of worldly vanity. And my lay clothes, I was changed for a monastic habit. So I was wearing the clothes of contemplative seekers down through the centuries. I was given a new name, uh, Brother Finbar, who was a, a hermit and then bishop of County Cork. So I was in this lineage of awakening. And uh, there was this monastic rhythm of, of of, of, of uh, prayer, silence, and manual labor, and so on, and uh, and the song. So, what I, what, how I experienced it, really, I, it just made complete sense to me. Mm-hmm. It really did. It was the first time in my life I knew order, and there was an ancient kind of rhythm to the day. And I also learned in chanting the Psalms that there is, there are words that break the depth of silence. But there are also words that embody and carry the cadences of the presence of God that's given in silence. And uh, so I just, I felt so at home with the whole thing. And then I saw Merton as a, a lineage holder in the Christian tradition. And he introduced me to the classical texts of the mystics. And also he taught me that it's universal, that this lineage in me, Thich Nhat Hanh came uh, to visit Merton and the Dharma, and he had, he had a very in-depth dialogue with the mystical Muslim tradition, the Sufi uh, tradition. And Abraham Joshua Heschel, the Jewish mystic and philosopher, came to visit him. And so I, I saw the universality of this radical primordial rhythm of life, and I was part of it like that. And so it just felt like homecoming to me. I just felt, you know, just... It, it fit just right yeah. for me. I just thought this this is it, you know. Yeah. Made sense. If the if the straw bed fits, right? Yeah, exactly. There's so much that you know you draw from from that time of uh from Dan Walsh and from Thomas Merton. And then you also have this parallel experience of the uh, abuse and terror from your confessor. And one of the things that I was 
struck by in in reading your memoir was we talk about the the art of active waiting until you have the grace to do what you need to yeah. do, and I found that to be a very uh, hopeful surrendering po- posture to to grace and to mercy. I'm wondering if you just might further that that thought of what, of the art of active waiting, particularly in that context where you have on one hand you have these teachers who you are who are inspiring and guiding you and on the other hand you have uh this abuse that's going on and you you hear a voice within yourself say i have to leave um but you're waiting with this active waiting for the grace to do what you need to do yeah you know one of this uh, like an aphorism a wording that comes to me that helps me a lot about prayer, meditation, and life is learning not to do violence to the fragility of our waiting. Mm. Yeah. That we, we catch ourselves in the act of perpetuating violence on the part of us that needs to be loved the most. The part that's still afraid, is still confused, is still engaging in hurtful patterns like this. And um, so to me, um, the, the art of active waiting is an art of knowing it isn't it, for me what it was is i i couldn't bring myself as a man to confront the priest or to end it i thought i had no right to do that he was a priest he was a monk who was widely respected in the monastery i just had no i had no right and yet at the same time i was kind of by not saying something i was in collusion with what i knew was so destructive mm. but i couldn't bring myself to say anything like this. So what active waiting is, is I think it's, it's waiting, and this has to do with the, al- the alcoholic who's still using. It has to do with any pattern. You become aware that no matter what the pattern might be, might be uh, quick to anger or passive aggressive behavior or resentment or prejudice or we always got some damn thing going on <laughs> or a brokenness. Yeah. And we, we can see it's hurtful, but we, we're traumatically bonded to it. We can't. So active waiting is this. I'm not able yet to step beyond this. But um, active waiting, I'm waiting for when the grace comes to do something, I will. Mm. And I, th- I call that active waiting. And often the event that breaks it open, you don't see it coming. You, know, you can't foresee. It's often messy when it happens. But um, you, and I also think this applies in other dimensions. I think that poets and artists and so on, I mean, just, there are people who are, they, they feel something emerging in them and they, they, it, it won't, it won't flow out. And they can sit for that for a long, long time. Mm. And that somehow you don't realize it, but, uh, you're being, you're being subtly transformed in the waiting. Mm-hmm. You know, like you're leaning into it, oh, an empty handed way like waiting, and things are being granted to you, you're being transformed by it, so when it ripens and comes out, you're all the more grateful for how long it took to, for it to happen. That's why sometimes this awakening we're speaking of, sometimes it happens, when quite young, we can be granted an awakening we spend the rest of our life learning to be faithful to. It's really true. And, uh, uh, but, and we have to grow out of the immaturity that surrounded that awakening. But it's also true that maybe very late in the game, we were awakened. But it's true, but because it took so long, you're all the wiser for it. You know, in an open-ended, freewheeling way, everything's right on schedule, yeah. in a way. And uh, we can learn to trust that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I love just how important that word yet, like uh, in, in that passage of like a, the... The, the art of waiting because you're not there yet, but it, it, that the great waiting for that indwelling grace to arrive yes, yes. in such a way that you can get to that yet or have faith in that yet that is still in motion. Um, it seems to be a, a, a lovely self forgiveness of like I of uh, and even going back to step one of like you know I'm not capable of changing myself. You know something really I think is so significant is that uh, when love. Uh, touches suffering. The suffering turns love into mercy, mm. uh, like uh, endlessly tender-hearted toward the hurting place. Mm-hmm. 
in the Buddhist language, uh, compassion is the body of emptiness. And the mystery of the cross, for, forgive them, they know not what they do, like this. And, uh, and so my sense, too, of the yet is I haven't realized yet the oceanic sustaining mercy that's already completely there, giving itself to me as the unfolding of my life that I've not realized yet. Mm -hmm. And so when it does come, it was really, it breaks the surface. But what breaks the surface and flows into your awareness, you realize was always, was, 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 was always there. Yeah. And always will be there up to the moment of our death and beyond, I think, really. Yeah. One of the themes uh, in your memoir that I think connects to the the act of waiting is the ways that you name some of these patterns of passivity uh, with your father and also with the priest. And then as you recognize the two in your first marriage and that you were modeling that uh, with your daughters. And maybe this connects to the yet, but one thing that came for me was thinking about risk, uh, the risk to leave, uh, you, the sense that you were risking death uh, if you were to, to stand up to your father, uh, that that there's these leaps that one has to take uh, and that you surely did take at different points in your life and that you still felt like you had these patterns of passivity that were just things you you also walked along with. Uh, and as somebody who also has my own patterns of passivity that I, that I work and relate to, how did that become something that you were able to have a conversation with to, to not have it be kind of that big door between you and making the choices that you needed to make for yourself? Yes. You know, I think one way I understand it is that, um, Uh, I was very uh, passive uh, with my father because I sincerely believed that to assert myself in any way was risking violence. Mm -hmm. death. And so uh, if I could just, you know, in psychotherapy sometimes we'll talk about, see, we offer external compliance to avoid being attacked or abandoned. And uh, the, the, the price tag we pay for that is we lose ourself. Mm. But at the same time, when you're in a situation where your life is threatened, see, it, it's uh, the in, instinctual thing to, pres to preserve ourself is really the passivity then is a way of honoring yourself. So when I was growing up and all the violence was going on, my passivity was a life-saving Yes. Thing. But what happened is, is that, see, it is, when trauma occurs, what we did to survive the trauma becomes internalized. And so we say, for example, because I was passive, I lived. But then we grow into adulthood and we say, because I am passive, I live. We're traumatically bonded to a life saving pattern that no longer applies, but in our inner world, we're still stuck in it. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I was never nurtured at home. Uh, I would sit alone watching television. And I would eat dissociatively to symbolically nurture myself. And so uh, eating disorders is ritualistic self-nurturance. So because I eat dissociatively, I live. Mm -hmm. Or don't eat dissociatively, I live. And because I raged, I lived. I tore the room apart, and because I rage, I live. So we get caught in these patterns that are actually patter survival patterns learned in trauma and abandonment, really is what they are. And what's sad is that, that we're punitive towards ourselves for those patterns, where we're ashamed of those patterns. Instead of being insightfully tenderhearted or insightful toward the pattern of how to be there for and with the hurting place, that we might learn to grow into more reality-based, more mature, loving patterns. And I think a lot of the wisdom path of growing, like the, the wisdom dimension, it grows out of those sensitivities like that. Mm -hmm. And I also learned, for me then, 
is that my passivity had another layer to it. And the passivity was one of surrender to God. It shows you how these complexities of all this. And uh, of surrendering to God who is um, a cre- uh, pouring herself out and infinitely giving the infinity of herself away in and as the immediacy of myself and my nothingness without God, this kind of a mystical understanding of creation. And I can remember I would sit in the monastery when I would sit in prayer in the church. Uh, I, I would, I would uh, like, I'd be still and know that I am God. And this silence, I would try to become so silent that I could hear God speaking me in all things into being. I could become so surrendered over but I would be surrendering over to this infinite love that was surrendering itself over to me, giving itself to me unexplainably as my life. And so there's these different layers of ever greater freedom of distortions and limitations and things like surrender and courageous expression and so on. It's part of the, as we kind of find our way like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the tools that helped you survive were not the tools that helped you deepen and transform later on in life you had to gain others to help to help you lean into the thriving of what how you were unfolding uh your unfolding path that's that's, that's exactly right so instead of using um my dissociativeness as the psychological uh space in which these mystical awakenings are being given to me Mm. I learned that the grace was being given to me is not to uh, endorse my dissociativeness, but to give me the courage to face my dissociativeness Mm -hmm. and to understand it and walk with it, accept it, and then learn not to depend on it, but how I could step forward in a grounded way and be more present and engaging with people. And so for me, the years I went through therapy, for my own trauma. A lot of it was that transformative process of transforming that yeah. process. Yeah. yeah. Something that, that I think ties in for me here um, is rituals. You know, you talk about ways uh, in which w- in your youth you would ritually reenact the abuse of your father to get that the purpose of the, of the relief afterwards. And then you also talk about, you know, the the rituals that you took on in life outside of the monastery to bring some of those monastic sensibilities and sensitivities and practices into your own life. That's, that's true. And of course, also the, the rituals that you shared in your married life with Maureen. I'm curious for you, Jim, what, are, what do you see as the inherent power of anything that's ritualized? Why do you think we need that and how does that help us on our kind of contemplative way? Yeah, here's one way I understand it. Uh, there's a, well, usually when I would start a Thomas Merton retreat, I would draw from the last two paragraphs of the last pages of his book, New Seeds of Contemplation. And he says, he says, the world and time are the dance of the Lord in emptiness. The silence of the spheres, that is the silence of the sun and the moon and the stars overhead. It, the silence of the spheres is the music of a wedding feast. And so he calls it a dance. And what is a dance? A dance is any movement repeated over and over to a rhythm. So there's the dance of the day yielding to the darkness of the night and the night yielding to the light of the day. Mm. There's the dance of the heat of summer yielding to the fall and the cold of winter and winter yielding thing. There's the dance of each each inhalation yielding to the exhalation that yields to the inhalation. There's the dance of standing up and sitting down, of being alone and being with others, of being virtuous and not virtuous at all. And so we're saying that this dance is a rhythm, is a rhythm. And, um, and so what we learn to see is that God is the infinity of the primordial rhythms of our life, like this. And, uh, and so we learn to see it as a dance, like a rhythmic dance. Like this. You know, in the Gospel of St. Thomas, one of the Gnostic Gospels, there's this lovely passage where it says at the Last Supper, Jesus told the disciples to get in a circle to hold hands. And he stood in the middle of the circle. 
and uh, he, he he had them. He, he he chanted, and he said, "Say un, say unto me, Amen." And they would go in a circle one way. He'd say another thing, Amen, going another back and forth. And he and he says, uh, uh, "I played for you, and you would not dance." And he said, a house I have not, I have houses, amen. And he goes on this lovely litany, the gospel. And when we really look at it, in a way, it seems to me, there is this rhythm of our life, like rhythm. And over time, the tonal quality of the rhythm shift in understanding and meaning and, and so on. And so it's like God is the infinity of the rhythms of our life, and God waits for us to find her there. It's like God forever comes to visit but we're rarely at home. We're probably out buying a spiritual book somewhere. <laughs> yeah. We're trying to figure something out so, so we'll feel okay inside. Uh -huh. But God's the rhythm of standing up and sitting down, breathing in and breathing in and out, being alone, being with others. And so it's, it's, in, the, it's in the rhythms, I think, the divinity of the rhythms of things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, I so appreciate that. I think of with my kids, you know, right now, you know, the world is obviously chaotic and has always been, but now we have 24 hour news to always let us know what we should be nervous about next. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of the things I've been trying to do with them is uh, help them pay attention to the phases of the moon. Yeah. Uh, so that there's this, this big bright reflection in the sky that they can attune themselves to as a way of passing time and a way of recognizing the, the, the phases of our, of our seasons, um, of our, of our days, that it becomes something to look forward to because it's, it's stabilizing to, to, to try to be in rhythm with, with, with the, the natural world, but also the way that I think the divine shows up in our lives, uh, and is calling us through these windows of nature to also, to, to, to dance in that dance. Exactly. Exactly. You know, two stories that come to mind is yeah. years and years ago, there was a commercial on television, I think it was by Sony, and uh, it showed a, a, a man with his little boy, maybe five years old, and they're standing at the shore of the ocean with their back to you looking out at the water, and they're watching the sunset. And at that, you know, there's just that moment when the sun disappears over the horizon. And they're standing there in silence. And when the sun disappears over the horizon, the little boy puts his hand in his daddy's hand and says, Daddy, do it again. <laughs> so daddy can't do it again because daddy didn't do it. See? And so the, the, so I say a seeker is someone for whom a grace has engendered a riddle. The grace is that which arises of itself. The riddle is we know not what to make of it mm. like this. And we get lost in the daily news. Martin Heidegger it says, uh, after, in the war, he said, you know, there were so many refugees after the war, homelessness. Yeah. And he said, but on farmlands all over Germany, there's people in their homes that their parents lived in, their grandparents lived in, their great great grandparents, the multi generational farmland. And they're, they're, they're sitting there as the darkness descends on their farmhouse, but they're gathered around the radio listening to the news. And they're homeless. They're they're taken away from the homeland mm -hmm. of these primordial patterns of life. And so I think that's the thing about children or about marriage or even our own solitude or our own if we let it, there are these places that take us to the primordial depth or rhythms of things. Mm -hmm. So we don't kind of spin out and get lost. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, uh, Jim at this in this season of your life, what, what is drawing you into that primordial depth? Well, I think uh, when Maureen did her second anniversary of her death, which is about a week ago, two weeks mm. ago. So what's drawing me now is, uh, and I'm, I'll be 80 years old in May. So I'm, I'm drawn by the silent rhythms of my own day. I, I, so I live here, Maureen and I lived for almost 30 years, and uh, the ocean is right outside the window. And uh, um, I, I'm writing an essay right now for one thing called The Divinity of Diminishment. And this, I sit here and I'm like, feel like I'm melting like a candle and I'm disappearing. <laughs> and uh, so I try just to be aware of the holiness of that, you know, all of that. And, and, and another thing that um, 
I try to be aware of is, uh, you know, Richard Rohr being invited me to be in the living, to teach like this, like I'm doing with you right now, mm -hmm. is, um, uh, or the memoir that I wrote. I feel I, I try to speak, I, I write six hours a day, I get up in the morning and light a candle and I sit and, um, I try to, uh, I try to bear, I try to pass on what was given to me, which is what you and I are talking about. Mm -hmm. It's non-objective and non-objectifiable. And, uh, so I, I, as long as I feel called to do so, I, I feel called how, uh, if I read I, the depth dimension of the gospel or any scripture, or any world religion or a text of a mystic, um, how could I, uh, sit with that so that I might uh, find words to express it through metaphors or examples from my heart that will flow out to touch the heart of the listener like this. And uh, I just I feel called to do that. So that, that's, I mean, that speaks to me. my daughters visiting me and keeping an eye out on me, for me, and the podcast turning to the mystics to do with Kirsten. Yeah. Um, that just, it's, it's like my life. How I put it is, uh, I'm, I'm amazed by my own life. I'm like a traumatized child from Akron, Ohio. They got led unexpectedly, up the, like, go figure. <laughs> and so I tell people I feel old, lonely, sad, tired, weak, amazed, and grateful. Mm. And I, I try to be grateful to the divinity of the rhythms of my day. And that, that calls to me. Mm. Yeah. Wow, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing so much of yourself and all those endeavors that you just named. I mean, it is, uh, there's a lot that you are pouring back into the world uh, at this time. And uh, I know I feel so grateful the the ways that you've, offer that in my direction and the yeah. thousands of others through all the ways through your courses and podcasts, living school. And now of course, through your memoir, the healing path, uh, yeah. it, it amazes me the ripple effect that all your work has and the way it continues to kind of endlessly yeah. offer and perpetuate the, the depths of the contemplative dimension. Um, yes, but it's not about you. It's about the way that you, right. uh, are, are open to being that 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 vessel that with the that that light underneath the rubble like it's all a part of uh that's right your little thing to do this this kid from akron yeah yes yeah, so it's just it's just so endlessly you I, well, another way i put it sometimes is that which is essential never imposes itself mm. and that which is unessential is constantly imposing itself right? but by a higher order wisdom of our awakened heart we can learn to lean into and be open to that, which none impositionally is giving itself to all of us. And I, I thank you for thanking me about my own journey. But you know, in our friendship with each other, you and I belong to a mutual admiration society. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm grateful to you mm. for your own sensitivity to this, which allows you to ask questions like this, mm. you know, like joining me and asking leading questions that kind of draws things out into the open that the listeners might be touched by. Mm. So it's, it's, it was a grace that you asked me. I'm so glad we could do this together. Yeah. 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 Um, well, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Yeah. And I promise not to prolong this, uh, mutual aberration society, but, uh, you know, it has been one of the greatest privileges of my professional career <laughs> to support your work. Uh, and it's mm. been one of the greatest, grace-filled privileges uh to have you as a teacher and a friend uh, and to bear witness to how you and marine engage in married life because it's been such an inspiration for me and how i approach marriage and how i how i imagine yeah. Uh, yeah. what is possible in the depths of marriage and not not settling for less um that's fine and yeah. there's this quote that you have in your book that uh that made me chuckle, but really, there, I, there's so many beautiful lines in, in your in your book. But the one that I had never heard you say before that really just touched me in this way was, uh, on the path to eternal fulfillment, which never ends, we all die as beginners. Yeah. And I took so much solace and hope from that. Uh, I'm 
as, as we start to round out our conversation, Jim, I'm curious, is, is there more that you can say about wh- what you mean by that and, and how that uh, poetically ripples out uh, from your own life? Yes. Um, you know, that's kind of paraphrasing Merton. Mm-hmm. Let's say that. And also Shunu Suzuki, a Zen mind beginner's mind. And uh, so Zen mind is this, be- this perpetual beginning like the virginal newness of each moment and and so on. So I I I, I think this is that um we're all gonna die as beginners, uh meaning uh I mean the sense I have of it is I guess to say is that on the arc of our life and as we move towards our death, that no matter how much of this we've internalized and no matter how much of this we've learned to appreciate and live by, you know, like a lifetime of of internalized realizations and the wisdom of the elders like this, that uh, it's just kind of believing and knowing that it's true, that when death comes, we move from a veil to unveiled fulfillment that's eternal. And so the, one of the Taoist sages, you know, Lao Tzu, the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be spoken yes. is not the eternal Tao. Well, another Taoist sage is Chuangsa. And I'll end with this story. I like this. This is how Chuangsa talks. Uh, he's personifying the river. He says that there's a mansion, there's a river, and there's a storm, a huge, huge storm. It goes on for days, just torrential downpour. And the river floods its banks for miles in both directions, floods the farmlands and, and everything. And it says the river rolled its eyes and said, look at me. I uh, see what I can do like this. And it kept, uh, it was so kind of into itself how great it was. It says, <laughs> until it got to the ocean. <laughs> and when it got to the ocean, it emptied out into the Tao. And so I think that's being a beginner. <laughs> Another way that I put it is imagine when we die, we cross over into heaven, and we've been there for a trillion, trillion, trillion years. And we're finally getting the hang of it. You know, we know all the angels and names on a first name basis, and we kind of we know our way around. And then God pulls a lever, and eternity begins all over again. Amen. Because there's no end to the endless. See? Uh, begin, Buddhists say beyond beginningless beginnings, beyond endless ends, and it's abyss-like, primordial, incomprehensibly vast and true, and it's giving itself away as us having this talk right now. Mm. You know, as each moment. And we're trying to deepen our clarity about that and, and live by it and share it. Mm-hmm. So those are some poetic insights that help me. Yeah. You know. To, uh, rings true. I, I like too, somebody once said that, that the, 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 uh, the contemplative teacher in these traditions, whether it be Buddhist or Christian, is there to let you know as gently as possible that you're beyond human help. See, really. And when you finally surrender and let go of what you're powerless to achieve, this infinity that's always there shines through the deep acceptance of your limits, like this. And it says that when we're in the presence of an awakened teacher, the teacher senses our respect for the teacher, and they accept it as a temporary arrangement. But they know that everything you see in them is completely true of you also. And they also know that you wouldn't believe them if they told you that. So as a temporary arrangement, they accept your recognition of them out of compassion because you're not yet ready yeah. to see that it's true of you too. Yeah. And I like that. That's I think it's so true. It's so true. It's true. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It is true. It is. Okay, great. Uh, Jim, I could go on and on asking you a thousand more questions, but I, I won't do that because uh, I think... Uh, what's been asked and what's been re- responded to is, is more than enough as we carry uh, on with our day. But I will ask you this one final question that I always ask guests is if you were going to pair our conversation with a drink, anything from water to whiskey, what would be your drink of choice and why? Well, you know, um, my wife, we live right here at the ocean. And so at, uh, at sunset, we would sit out on the porch and watch the sun go down over the ocean. And uh, my wife, who was in AA for years, saved her life, really. So she'd have iced tea or a glass of water. 
and I'd have a glass of wine or scotch or something. And I would, I would, I would write on my manuscript and we would talk and watch the sun go down. And, and I, and we called it muffin hour. We always called it muffin hour. And, uh, and so, uh, right now I, I have muffin hour. I, I light a candle and I said, as the sun goes down. So right now I'm, I'm really into, uh, scotch. Mm. Uh, I, I'm into scotch and, um, uh, with a lot of ice. And I sip the the warmth of the scotch, and uh, I would compare a conversation to uh, a, a nice glass of of sipping scotch, sipping scotch, like this. But for those who are alcoholic, I would compare it to sipping iced tea. Mm. See, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, so what you, but I would compare it to, to the warmth of scotch, and one of my favorite ones. That I like. There's a drink called Drambui. Drambui. Of Scotland. And it's very rich and warm. And, uh, so I'm partial to Drambui also. So I would, I would say even more Drambui <laughs> because of the warm richness <laughs> of it. And so I, it's like drinking Drambui. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah. I love it. Uh, maybe somewhere down the road we can clink a glass of Drambui. <laughs> that would be lovely. That'd be so, so nice, yo. Thank you for listening to this episode of Contemplify. It is a delight to bring these contemplative conversations to you. May it refresh you and possibly be a refuge of contemplative musing. And I hope a moment or two will be carried into the rest of your day. You can slide over to contemplify.com to find the show notes for this episode, including links to the resources mentioned in this conversation. If you are keen or moderately on the fence to read more musings from me, you can also sign up for the monthly Contemplify non-required reading list newsletter. You can do so over at contemplify.com. If you are enjoying Contemplify or new to it, please subscribe, rate, and review Contemplify on your podcast player. The internet is a big place. This helps spread the Contemplify cheer. The theme song for Contemplify is called Langside by Charles Enns and Darren Hovius. Fellas, thanks as always. I'm still in the throes of putting together the next season of Contemplify. It is going to be a treat. In the meantime, I'll share some more musings as life allows it. May this find you with music that moves your soul, a pen to put to paper and mark your interior journey, your healing path, something to sip on to close out the day. I'm looking forward to bringing you more musings and more conversations with contemplatives in the world in the near future. Until then, be well. Be well.